Craig, Craig, look at your hand. Our hands are bleeding. Oh, you kids make me sick. Oh, please, use my body to keep you alive. It's our hands and small tag. Drugs, often the introduction comes in the form of a goofball. It's our hands and small tag. Paula, I may be a bitch, but I'll never be a butch. It's our hands and small tag. <laughs> the height of a fictionalized Cold War in either a Yugoslavia of the future or a made-up East European country, with evidently a completely blank national flag. Love-struck John Johnson and unemployed pal Lewis meditate on the progress of a growing flower and mull over Lewis's prospects for work. John is about to be married, and the strapped Lewis frets because he can't afford a wedding present or formal wear for the ceremony. We're then treated to a tour of John's newly and sparsely furnished apartment, which John has laid out as a love bungalow for himself and his beloved. A neighbor gives him a quick lesson on the basics of conjugal furniture arrangement. Meanwhile, they hear a town crier announce a declaration of war, but John, lost in dreams of his upcoming wedding, pays them little mind. Dodging a fleeting air raid panic and a run-in with a pacifist cab driver, John hoofs it to bride-to-be Maria's idyllic family home. Her clan has been listening anxiously to radio reports about the rapidly spreading conflict and wonder aloud if the wedding should be postponed. But amid their pastoral setting and the family's joy over John and Maria's soon-to-be union, the war seems distant. Forgetting the world's troubles, they gamble gleefully to church to wed the happy young lovers. Their luck doesn't hold. Pandemonium breaks out in the middle of the ceremony as bombs start following, and the terrified wedding party scatters before the vows are even exchanged. My children, all of this was important yesterday, but not today. So, I believe we should hurry and get it over with. Maria Marina, do you take John Johnson as your husband to love, honor, and obey? Yes! John Johnson! My son, do you take for it? <laughs> Maria and John narrowly survive a spectacular fusillade of bomb blasts, which stirs a choking despair in the discombobulated bride. She expresses bitter relief not to have been wed in such a cold and violent world, but the irrepressibly optimistic John consoles her and urges her to struggle on. Darling, we might die. <laughs> no, my sweet. We're in love. It's impossible to die. Unfortunately, as they make their way back to John's little love nest with Maria's consumptive and frail cousin Jack, a passing officer abruptly conscripts them. John and Maria are thus tragically separated in the street and lost to each other, neither knowing the other's destination. Maria, write to me. Where? I don't know, Maria. Atomic War Bride is a surprisingly counter-establishment and politically charged satire, considering it came out of Tito's authoritarian Yugoslavia at the height of the Cold War. Tito, of course, maintained neutrality in the U.S.-Soviet conflict, and since Atomic War Bride's satire mainly targets the futility of mutual assured destruction, it makes sense that Tito's government would approve of it. Still, it's a stunningly candid movie, coming from a nation that outlawed democratic political parties. For a something weird title, Atomic War Bride also has impressive production values. The bombing sequences benefit from generous and precisely laid pyrotechnics, are lent a powerful authenticity through the use of dozens or hundreds of extras, abundant military hardware including jeeps, tanks, and jet aircraft, and smoldering rubble spanning whole city blocks. 
Presumably, ruins still unrestored from World War II served as found locations, giving the movie an effortless realism. War Bride is equal parts tragedy and comedy, though it comes at both these registers a bit unsurely. Its jokes tend to be too silly to be laugh-out-loud funny, for example, though the movie's dubbing may have had something to do with this. In fact, its humor, as well as its kitschy clockwork orange meets Buck Rogers sets and costumes, seem meant more to disorient the viewer than to amuse her, and give the movie an air of surrealism as a counterpoint to its convincing special effects. Many of the jokes take as their butt the pointlessness of warfare and the self-delusion of civil defense, as when an officer in Roy Scheider look-alike distributes radiation suits to a terrified populace and trains them in their use by having them drill uselessly on donning and removing the suit's hoods over and over. Such blank repetition is also a theme, as we see later when the newly drafted John and Jack are taught how to work their rifles by an instructor who has them waggle their trigger fingers hysterically as though this were all there was to operating a firearm. Start by moving slow, and then faster. 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 The movie's jokes actually feel a bit like something you'd expect a Joseph Heller or Kurt Vonnegut to write and then discard. Though they're a bit off pitch, their targets, war's senselessness, the cold inefficiency of military bureaucracy, the unresponsiveness of government to the people's will, is always crystal clear. The movie's forays into tragedy are similarly overblown, teetering between sorrow and outright melodrama. Jack's overacted frailty, for instance, makes his unfortunate fate at boot camp far too predictable to be particularly sad. And then there's the matter of John and Maria's resolute pacifism, which is meant to underscore the injustice of John's conscription and the asundering of Maria's family through no doing of their own. At the time the movie was made, the fledgling peace movement in the West doubtless seemed much more inspired and promising. But a half century on, the movie's pacifism comes across, rightly or wrongly, as naive and two-dimensional. All that said, Atomic War Bride actually dates impressively for reasons beyond its production values and gee whiz moments of spectacle. For one, it focuses particularly on war's effects on civilians rather than combat soldiers. The horrors and honors of front line fighting have long been the preferred subject of war movies from John Wayne to Saving Private Ryan, but rare is the movie that presents the plight of those caught in the crossfire. Not War Bride, which not only shows the war in contrast to more everyday conflicts, Lewis's job troubles Jack's weak heart, but also portrays war-torn cities not as abandoned, but as crowded with the disoriented and displaced. War's main harvest, it would seem, is the homeless refugee with nothing but the sack on her back and no destination but the next street corner or fallout shelter. It's an aspect of war that's a race for us in the West, not only in movies, but in reality, as the plight of war refugees from conflicts as diverse as Kosovo, Iraq, and Vietnam are either ignored or given scant mention in the mainstream press. Later in the movie, we're also treated to an oddly prescient image. A heads-up broadcast of a nuclear missile's trajectory as it closes on the enemy population, which John and Maria's president shows to demonstrate the power of the military's weapons and thereby boost morale. It's a familiar sight for those who saw the green screen missile cams used to help sell the first Persian Gulf War and all those wars that have followed by giving the false impression that high-tech missiles are perfectly precise and harmless, except to the guilty, that aerial bombardment has no more unpleasant reality than a video game. Here, though, the strategy backfires. The on-screen missile strike horrifies the civilian onlookers and finally galvanizes them to organize in their opposition to the war. If only it had had a similar effect on us.
Thank you.